Colleagues, welcome back. I really don't want to, I know the theme of today is conversations, but I really feel I'm interrupting a conversation by pulling us back together for the afternoon. I hope you had a lovely lunch, and I really hope from the buzz in the room that you took the opportunity to do exactly as we said this morning, to continue the SLF conversations over lunch and building those networks and collaborations that Santiago talked to us about this morning. I'm delighted to be here again this afternoon to open this afternoon's SLF conversations, which will include a keynote from our Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills, Jenny Gilruth. Ms Gilruth's keynote today will also be streamed live, so I'm feeling slightly worried Ms Gilruth and that Ian, the cameraman, has disappeared, but I'm sure he'll be back or working his remote control just shortly. Um, so it'll be streamed live as well as being recorded. So as well as hearing from Ms Gilruth in the room today, um, we will also, um, as I say, stream it live, but also it will be available to watch on our um, website later on. And there'll be opportunities, as Ollie said earlier, for you to ask questions following um, Ms. Gilruth's keynote this afternoon. And remember my encouragement, at the my encouragement at the start of today, these are conversations, so it's really important that you engage, that you reflect, you ask questions, and you challenge. That's the, the point of uh, all of the SLF conversations. And Ms. Gilruth, just before I invite you up to the stage, um, I thought it would be really helpful just to share really briefly some of the key themes that Santiago was talking about this morning that really resonated with us in the room and in any of the conversations I was having over lunchtime, people were talking about these as, as really important messages. Firstly, the strong position that Scotland is already in. It was, it's so lovely to hear of a, an international visitor talking about Scotland's work and the fact that we have so many of the, the key component parts for a strong education system in place. He also talked to us about the importance of creating conditions for children to learn rather than simply being taught. And I think that's something that we were all reflecting on as part of this morning's discussion. The importance of a really strong focus on pedagogy. And again, in the table conversations, people were talking about the, the, the real opportunity to get back to what Santiago calls the pedagogical core and actually how we use that to influence our decisions. And also, about the ability as a system for those in the room and beyond to really step up to that challenge for change and reform. So those were some of the really key themes. And I know that they'll be important to you too, Ms. Gorruth, and that colleagues might pick these up as part of the question and answer session later on. So without further ado, I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to hand over to our Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills. Thank you, uh, Gillian, and good afternoon. It's great to be with you today at the Scottish Learning Festival. Um, I know there are folk joining online, um, but nice to see people in real life too. I was reflecting on the first time I attended the SLF back in 2012, and the last time I attended the SLF was in 2019. On both occasions, uh, I wasn't working in a school. Now, we all know the reasons why it's difficult for staff to get out of school and um, to have time for CPD. And it's great we now have that online connectivity, which is allowing folk to join, of course, this afternoon. But I should say uh, I'm very pleased that the festival this year has regained an element of in-person uh, events. But in future, I would really like the SLF to be for everyone who works in Scottish education. This has got to be a celebration of all that is good in Scottish education. And I want those who are working with our children and young people right now to have the opportunity to experience that. Now, every educator, be that early years, school teachers, or those working in the college sector, who I know I think we have represented in the room today, should have that opportunity. But it's not just to attend and be here today, it's to take part, it's to be enthused, it's to share good practice, and to be enthused about learning. Our schools and education settings have faced upheaval over the course of the last two years. Largely, yes, as a result of the pandemic, but I have to reflect that industrial action this week and earlier in the year has also played a part. Now, being out of school has impacted on our children and young people. It's changed the type of learning we see in our classrooms. It's altered relationships, usually built over time and with consistent expectations. For some of our children, school will be the only constant that they have. A place of safety and refuge, that sanctuary was removed from them during the pandemic. And I think we shouldn't pretend it's business as normal. Layered on top of our new normal, we now have a cost of living crisis. Inflationary pressures mean everything costs more, and working families particularly are feeling it. And let's be clear, inflation feels much different if you live in poverty. 
Last year, the ONS calculated that the poorest tenth of UK households suffered the sharpest jump in the cost of living. And in late 2022, the gap between inflation faced by the poorest and wealthiest households widened to the largest since the financial crisis of 2009. We've got higher energy bills, more expensive food prices. They've all been hitting our poorest children and their families hardest, and all while we continue to recover from a global pandemic. And so it is in this really challenging context that I think we need to sharpen some of our key aspirations in Scottish education. Closing the poverty-related attainment gap will be harder with inflation running at over 6%. But we remain absolutely determined to continue the, to increase the pace of progress. That's one of the reasons why in Scotland we have invested so heavily in the Scottish Child Payment. It's a really central component of our social justice agenda and it means an estimated 90,000 fewer children live in poverty in Scotland this year. It's why we're committed to expanding free school meals for all primary school children, which saves families on average £400 a year for every eligible child. And it's why we've invested so heavily in providing our young people with access to free bus travel up to the age of 22. But it's still very tough for our young people just now. And I think there is undoubtedly a ceiling to the action that any Scottish government can take in our attempts to alleviate poverty within our current devolved context. So I don't have a blank sheet when it comes to education reform. I've got a workforce who are still pretty unhappy. Uh, with local or national government following industrial action. Believe me, I know it. I've got children and young people whose behaviour appears to be changing in response to external factors. Yes, COVID is one of those factors, but the cost of living crisis is having an ongoing impact in our schools. And the financial context that the government is facing is extremely challenging due to inflation, pay increases, and the catastrophic mismanagement of the economy by the UK government. So we're not alone in this regard. The Welsh government are facing similar challenges. There is no blank sheet in Scottish education. And the realities of life post-COVID really, I think, necessitate a rethink and a refocus on the attributes and the skills that we do have. So what we do have in Scotland is a skilled degree-educated teaching workforce. I think that's a major strength of education in Scotland. It's one that doesn't exist in every other part of the UK, and it's one that I'm keen we recognise and we build on. Because I want to have teachers who enjoy coming to their place of work, teachers who enthuse their children and young people, teachers who love their subject, their sector or their specialism. That's why we all get into the profession. And as Cabinet Secretary, I want to do everything I can to empower our teachers to focus full square on making that positive difference to the lives and aspirations of their pupils in their care. Our education system has a very long history of excellence in learning and teaching. We have in Scotland the highest spending on school education and more teachers per pupil than any other UK nation. As a result of our current pay deal, we also have the highest paid teachers in the UK. But we don't just have to celebrate inputs, and nor should we. These are important, but we have outcomes that we need to celebrate too. We have record numbers of students from our most deprived communities entering university as we continue to protect the principle of free tuition. We have record numbers of school leavers in positive destinations nine months after leaving school, now at 93.5%. And this year, the number of vocational and technical qualifications achieved grew to a record high, with more than 72,000 qualifications in 2023, an increase from over 12% from 2022. So our curriculum promotes a really strong culture of attainment and achievement. It allows our young people to build up a portfolio of qualifications, skills and experiences before they leave school. We should celebrate those strengths and we should use them as a springboard from which to deliver improvement. That's why I want us to start talking about excellence in Scottish education again, highlighting the excellence where it exists now and demanding excellence in the future where it doesn't yet. I want to focus on excellent learning and teaching, on pedagogy, as we heard from Gillian earlier, ambitious schools which are in turn ambitious for our young people. Above all, a renewed collective urgency to our shared national mission to close the poverty-related attainment gap. One of the best parts of being an MSP is the chance to get to visit schools. And as Cabinet Secretary, I'm privileged to get the opportunity to visit and engage with so many of our young people and staff all across the country. And what I see on those visits is a teaching profession and support staff that do an incredible job in a challenging environment post-COVID and during that ongoing cost of living crisis I mentioned previously. We have a cohort of young people who have grown up with disruption to their formal education. COVID led to changes in attendance patterns for some children and young people, and we've seen changes in behaviour and relationships in our schools. 
Certain year groups appear to be disengaging from formal education right at a time in which we need to pull them in. Specifically, those people who experience transition, for example, during the pandemic, so for example, primary seven into S1, and those in SDS4. We all need to redouble our efforts to ensure that our children and young people are fully engaged in their education. So attendance is absolutely vital. And I'm willing to explore all options and ideas to make progress, and I'd be keen to hear any suggestions to that end people may have this afternoon. For young carers, of course, the pressure to stay at home may be hugely challenging when the pandemic showed us that education could be delivered digitally. But we also know that not all of our children experienced the pandemic equally. Some of our children had warm homes, gardens and digital devices. They had support from outstanding teachers who uploaded regular learning opportunities uh, online. Some children went hungry. They lived in damp flats with no opportunity to get outside. Some of them didn't have access to laptops. And it's true to say that not every young person experienced the kind of support that we would have expected. That inequality is still being felt today. This week, many of our children will experience a return to engaging with their education on a screen. Remote learning, though, is not a substitute for real life teaching. Face-to-face -face quality learning and teaching is the X factor. It is that interaction, that knowledge of your young people, which makes the difference. That's why relationships are so fundamental to all that we do. I think it's fair to say that improving teaching and learning experiences and outcomes is a shared ambition in this room and across the wider education sector. But this has to be a shared endeavour, which is why I'm absolutely committed to refocusing the relationship between government and the profession in support of that aim. Government, both locally and nationally, needs to work more effectively with our teachers and those who work in education to get this right. How best to deliver on the ambitions in classrooms will vary, as it does within individual schools. But our teachers, our head teachers in school communities, need to be empowered to drive innovation while also sharing that best practice. Working closely with our partners in local government will be important, underpinned by the guiding principle that every school in Scotland must have high ambitions for every child, no matter their circumstances. That also means that we need to start confidently addressing variation in relation to performance of our local authorities. That too is where we can make the inputs that will challenge and support what needs to improve. And I see a key role for the new independent inspectorate in that regard too. We know that progress is being made in closing the poverty-related attainment gap across a range of measures. So we know that the gap between the proportion of school leavers from our most and least deprived communities is now the narrowest since 2019. Pass rates at NAT5, higher and advanced higher, are above the 2019 pre-pandemic levels. I think that shows clear and continuing recovery from the pandemic. The latest primary school data on literacy and numeracy, again, shows the biggest reduction in the attainment gap in one year since we started to collect this data. This is real progress, and it's up to all of us now to go further. This is the room of our ambition, this is the floor, rather, of our ambition, and there is nowhere near the ceiling. Government at all levels clearly has a central role to play here that will require ambition, focus, and strong leadership. And as Cabinet Secretary, I will do everything in my power to deliver further progress, but that means doing everything in my power to support our teachers in delivering excellence in our classrooms. That is where we make the difference. Later this year, I'll update Parliament and provide more detail on the next steps for education and skills reform. These next steps will be set in the context of the programme for government, which commits to tackle poverty and improve educational equity and ensure sustainable public services. This includes, of course, our commitment to help lift children out of poverty through the Scottish Child Payment and ensuring that children are not learning on an empty stomach through the expansion of access to free school meals, for example. We're also increasing the pay of childcare staff and we'll be expanding access to high quality childcare too, which is really essential, particularly for women rejoining the labour market. And as I've mentioned, we are delivering the teacher pay deal, which will ensure that teachers in Scotland continue to be the best paid across the UK. We need to ensure the highest quality support for children and young people with additional support needs too. We know that over a third of our young people now have an identified additional support need. And that continues to increase and improving support will be a key priority for me. That's why we set out in the programme for government that we will work with teachers to provide additional professional learning opportunities to help improve experiences and outcomes for children and young people with additional support needs. I mentioned earlier that quality teaching can have an unparalleled impact on young people's outcomes. And I'm determined to empower all of our teachers to ensure they can make the difference that we all know they can to the lives of the young people that they teach. Another area where I'm determined to support our teachers is in the important work that we are undertaking on behaviour and relationships in school 
following the pandemic. Now, I don't necessarily buy into the tabloid analysis of this issue, which looks to capture extreme events and present them as evidence of a wider picture of unrest in our schools. I do think, I know, that there are isolated incidents in our schools which can be extreme in nature. The challenge, therefore, is how our local authority partners respond to challenging behaviour in our schools when it happens. Behaviour, as we all know, is a form of communication. Pupils need appropriate support to respond to that communication. But we must not forget that staff need support too. I'm very grateful to the wide range of teachers and other practitioners and partners, including representatives of parents and carers, who I think will be absolutely key, in the, who have been taking part in the various phases of the behaviour summits which I've been leading. I look forward to the findings of the Behaviour in Scottish Schools survey, which we'll publish in November, and working together with the profession and our local authority partners on the practical action we need. I'd like to turn now to talk to the work carried out by Professor Louise Hayward. As I'm sure you'll all be aware, in June, Professor Hayward set out detailed and comprehensive uh, recommendations for government. And it's clear from her engagement that there is an appetite for improving the approach to qualifications and assessment that we currently have. Recommendations in the final report centre around the introduction of a Scottish diploma with three mandatory elements, a personal pathway, programmes of learning and project learning. If implemented, this could represent a very significant change. Given the current challenges and pressures faced by our, school, our schools at the current time, I think we need to move forward with caution. Because if we are to affect substantial structural and cultural change, we must ensure that teachers, lecturers and educationalists and young people themselves have the capacity to benefit from that change. Those will be my key considerations as we work through next steps on reform. And as we look towards ongoing reform, I'd like to close now by reflecting on previous reform in education. Curriculum for Excellence was the right thing to do. CFE meant that Scottish education is now focused on excellent learning and teaching and innovative pedagogy. But a paradigm shift like the introduction of CFE really required high quality partnership working and a strong professional learning offer. Professor Hayward noted in her report that teachers felt as though all the responsibility for putting CFE into practice was theirs. And I remember that feeling of responsibility as a classroom teacher. So how we move forward will be crucial in delivering the improvements for our young people that we need to see. But I can't possibly hope to reform our qualification system without Scotland's teachers. They are the glue that holds the system together and your interventions change lives. They also have the professional expertise needed to help improve our qualifications offer. That requires ambition, focus and strong leadership to support the profession and of course Scotland's children. I look forward to working together with all of you to reform Scotland's education system for the benefit of the next generation. Thank you very much for having me along this afternoon 